Night had fallen hours before, and the darkness of the Everfree Forest smothered the pale illumination of the moon as it tried in vain to penetrate the depths of the wooded landscape. Beneath the brows of the crooked trees, the woods was a void of impenetrable blackness, and only the creatures of the night stalked their prey. On this night, one such creature had happened across an oddity in the pitch, a source of light. Woodworm stalked the darkness masterfully, his wooden paws silent as he traversed the wooden floor for hapless meat. He was a timber wolf, and the alpha of his pack. Woodworm's thick bark skin wore more scars from challengers, and his jaws had crushed the life out of every upstart who dared challenge his place's leader. He was larger than most other wolves, and his strength was feared not only by his pack, but others in the Everfree Forest. To withhold Wormwood proper respect would be ripped to pieces by his sharp teeth and powerful jaws. He was more monster than wolf, and he loved the feeling of bones splintering in his ferocious mouth, and savored the delicious lifeblood as it flowed from his victims. This night, the Alpha Wolf would fill his belly on the quivering flesh of whatever delicious morsels crossed his path. Timberwolves were primarily pack hunters. During a hunt, the group would split and search for victims separately, covering more ground and increasing their chances of finding a victim. Once a meal had been spotted, Wormwood would silently circle it and then signal the rest of the group with a howl, quickly giving chase to the food and directing it to the middle of the pack's hunting zone. The poor meal would run for its life, careening wildly through the maze of trees in blackness that swallowed its vision. Hoping to lose the gnashing teeth of the terrible beast pursuing it, but unknowingly being herded into the mists of not one timber wolf, but an entire pack. The part Wormwood savored was the most when the prey spotted the others and turned. The horrified reaction that it had been tricked, trapped, and would soon be torn apart, dawning in its panicked eyes. That was the thrill that made the chase worthwhile. Sinking his long fangs into the flesh of the prey was second to seeing the creature's fear and desperation. Wormwood was interested in the light. Each time he had encountered fires in the past, it had meant a very memorable meal. Ponies, changelings, and other intelligent creatures would give away their location with fire, beckoning him and his kind. It was a dinner bell, a flashing neon sign that read, All you can eat, and he eagerly stalked the foolish beings. Their terror was the best. Wormwood's eyes reflected the pitiful campfire, causing them to squint, even as such a tiny source of illumination was ailing to them. The beast crouched as his eyes adjusted to the following or the flow of the flickering flames his wooden body easily camouflaged in a thicket of assorted trees. After a moment, the flames ceased to sting, and his vision corrected himself, allowing him to take in the scene. The wolf's eyes spied a small clearing that housed a wooden wagon serving as a mobile home and stage with a red-tiled roof. From the rear of the vehicle was a sign that hung just above the door with a crescent moon hung onto it. The sign was wooden as well, and had a wand superimposed into the same crescent moon shape, all surrounded by stars. The wagon was only a shape in the darkness. A fragile orange glow from the nearby campfire barely touched the traveling domicile. Around the fire, rocks were placed in a circle. 
has a protective breach, allowing this specific fire's chance for escaping being relatively low. And sitting only a few feet away was a sky-colored pony, wrapped in a purple cloak with a triangular hat pulled low to protect her against the bitter cold of the night. Wormwood's mouth watered. Ponies were his favorite food, and it had been far too long since he last banqueted of pony flesh. He didn't need the pack for this ignorant meal. He would enjoy it alone, basking in the tender meat of the pony. The Timberwolf silently circled the pony, moving behind the wagon and adhering to the darkness, preparing to strike from the pony's blind side. He was going to enjoy crushing her throat and staring deeply into her eyes as they widened in terror and struggled before finally going dead. Seeing the life drain from her horrified face would be the icing on the cake, the cake of a mouth-watering pony meal. He lowered himself and crept without a sound into attacking distance. The wolf crouched and prepared for the leap that would end with blood and shredding muscle. If he could grin, he would have as the killing moment arrived. Wormwood leapt, teeth bared and drooling as he tore through the air. Thoughts of mayhem ripped in his mind. The great and powerful Trixie Lulamoon was no fool. Despite that her antics in the town of Equestria were designed to show, and her magic had detected the lurching Timberwolf long before he would become a danger, Trixie had waited as he endorsed his predatory nature and moved into position for the kill. Trixie was a predator as well. Her favorite tactic of misdirection had worked again, as it always did. She waited until the wolf snuck and struck to set her magical abilities loose upon him. Trixie's horn flared to life. A brilliant, blinding, bluish-white light roared from her horn, and the wolf, wolf had suddenly frozen in air. His assault paused, and his body stuck inside the magical field of the unicorn. Trixie stood and lifted her wizard hat to reveal a pair of lavender eyes, bent in a knowing and boastful expression. A small prideful smirk played upon her features as she moved to stare into the creature's face. You thought you could get the best of the great and powerful Trixie? The pony broke a couple of condescending chuckles at the paralyzed and floating beast locked in place by her magical powers. You are a foolish creature to think that some pony as strong as I could be your neck, could be taken so easily. Trixie Lula Moon regarded the beast with a sudden anger filling her small frame. Thought you'd eat me, dear Timberwolf. Well, take a nibble, won't you? She gently placed her foreleg between the open jaws of the beast inviting it to retch away her flesh. Her spell held the wolf motionless, of course, and she feigned disappointment in response. Oh, I'm afraid I can't fit all of me into your mouth. Let me help you open it a bit wider. As the unicorn's magic began prying, Wormwood's jaws opened wider. For the first time in his long life, he was afraid. He had never been unable to control his body, nor bested, by another being. This was supposed to have been an easy meal for him, but this unicorn was different from any other pony upon which he had preyed. Her eyes showed no fear, and she had led him into a trap. His jaws screamed as his mouth opened impossibly wide, the skin splitting back from the pressure and the bones dislocating. His body was locked in place, and he couldn't howl in pain but his mind shrieked in both terror and agony. His skin ripped further back from his mandible, and the terror streaked back into his throat. The pain was sheer insanity, and he couldn't help but hear the ripping of the flesh, muscles, and cartilage as the lacerations continued to flow down the sides of his body, 
He was being torn in two, and was powerless to stop it. Trixie stared into the beast's eyes, a direct link into his mind, and basked in the inferno of pain she saw inside those orbs. This monster had meant to kill and eat her, and she took a sick pleasure from watching the tables turn. After a few mind-wrenching moments, she had taken enough time to warm herself in his terrified psyche, and finish the spell with one quick thought. The wolf's body split completely down the middle, from jaw to tail, and floated in two distinct halves. She chuckled to herself, and floated the split wolf to her little campfire, suddenly breaking it into smaller pieces, magically, which she then piled atop the flickering flames. She had needed some kindling, so the timber wolf's appearance had been fortunate. She released her magic over what was left of the beast and stroked the flames of her fire. Watching it bellow and hungrily eat at the wooden body, growing into a blaze that was worthy of the mighty magician. Lily Moon couldn't help but laugh to herself. She enjoyed revealing even a fraction of her true power, something she could never do in the towns of Equestria. She thought back to her great game in Ponyville only a few nights before, the same one she played in every town. She had easily bested the dim-witted earth ponies and pegasi of the backwater town, of course, and the pathetic unicorns that had been paltry and magically devoid. She had just about given up on finding a suitable source of magic in the town when she had shown her pretty purple horn. The lavender main mare's magic had been enticingly strong, probably the strongest Trixie had encountered, and she could hardly contain herself at the thought of. A sudden flux of mysticism struck the Lumaire, interrupting her thoughts and sending a painful streak from her horn back through her head, crying, causing her to cry out in pain. It only lasted a moment, a warning of what was to come, and Trixie felt her powers wane momentarily. The mare pulled herself from before the campfire and trotted to the door of her wagon, magically opening it and stepping inside the small vehicle. She needed a little pick-me-up, something to hold her over until she could obtain that powerful unicorn. The living area of the wagon was barely large enough for Trixie to house her show materials and to sleep in, but that was only in the physical realm. Trixie's or magicians of Trixie's magnitude, had ways of increasing dimensions, and as the sky blue mare called upon her magic again, the fabric of reality ripped, and she stepped through the breach into her real living quarters. This room was large and draped in rich, rich textiles in blue and purples, each embroidered with Trixie's cutie mark. It was her symbol, and someday the world would know it. A thick couch had pla been placed in the middle of the room, and a long shelf of books of varying degree and age on the subject spanned one whole side of the room. Many of the books were rare, and nearly all of them contained treaties on the arts of mysticism. Trixie was a scholar of the magical arts, but did not limit her studies to equestrian pursuits. She was certain there was much more that could be learned from the cultures of others, and thus she had amassed a collection of arts and that ranged from pyromancy of genia, the shamanism of zebra, and even the dark arts of the bat folk. Trixie stopped for a moment as another pain shot through her horn and head. The dimensional room rippled as her powers threatened to fail. She had gone too long without eating and her strength was fading. She knew her rations were running low, but the last few towns had been devoid of what she needed. That's what she got for slumming through those rural towns. She let out a soft moan as she rubbed her horn with her ho hooves and waited for the feeling to pass. She would need to find some more food before long if she wanted to keep her strength up. The last meals she had left were not of good quality, but once again, that was her penance for visiting those podunk 
communities. Sometimes you found rare treasures, but mostly it was just a lot of common stock. Trixie flopped onto her couch, the material soft and inviting, and pressing her head into the cool material, sighing as the temperature soothed her aching head. In a moment, the pain passed, and she called into reality before her small table with a sp silver spoon and napkin resting upon it. Her horn glowed again, and a box materialized, covered with ice that kept her dinners from going bad during the periods between meals. The metallic instrument spent its time in a frozen land, waiting for Trixie's call. She smiled and opened the box, gazing inside the cold fog drifting from the open container. The fog drifted out and covered the immediate vicinity. It licked at her legs and body, tingling and raising chills across her body. It was a ritual to which she had grown accustomed to, and her mouth salivated in conditioning response. She would soon eat, her head would cease its throbbing, and she would feel her strength reviving. Trixie finally reached into the box and pulled one of the two meals she had remaining, the head of a frozen unicorn. Trixie took a moment to look at the bodiless remains. The mare had a pink coat, the fur frozen in place. The icicles dangled from her horn and muzzle. Her eyes lay open and rolled up to stare lifelessly at the ceiling. She wore a calm expression on her face, however. Trixie had very quickly severed the head from the neck magically, and the unicorn hadn't even known she was there. It had been a weak prize, but Trixie couldn't be picky. She needed substance, and the pink unicorn was the best Hoofington had to offer. Placing the head on the table and letting it stand on its own power on the severed neck, Trixie sighed with a little disappointment. She banished the icebox back to whence it came, some frozen tundra far to the north. Her horn glowed again, creating a blade of brilliant energy a few inches long, which she used to slice up the tip of the dead pony's horn. Trixie bit her lip as she gazed at her meal but forced herself to be patient. She would need to heat it up first. She dismissed the blade and concentrated on the corpse. Within seconds, the ice melted and steam piped from the hole in the horn that led into the brain. The stench was almost erotic and Trixie eagerly pressed her lips around the spell-casting aroma, gently sucking in case she had overheated the brain inside. A small amount of dribble onto her tongue, and a delightful temperature that was neither too hot nor too cold, and she pulled harder, filling her mouth with soupy goodness. The warmth traveled down her throat as she swallowed happily, and the taste was semi-sweet and bitter, like the earthy flavors of rutabagas, turnips, or beets. The taste had taken a long time to acquire, but she enjoyed it now, surmising that the benefit somehow tricked her mind into accepting it. Already she could feel her magical strength returning, bolstering from the lingering power of the dead mare's brains. Her mind felt alive and an emptiness that she did not really perceive filled. Her horn and eyes glowed with an eerie light as she strode, stole what little power the weak mare possessed. Trixie finished what remained of the liquefied brain, turning the head up and shaking it out to force the last few brownish drops from the chipped horn to fall into her eagerly awaiting mouth. She shivered as the last vestiges of magical energies transferred from the decapitated unicorn to her, her body feeling alive as if millions of tiny organisms crawling, crawled over her flesh. The blue mare lay on her couch, velvetly plush, 
consuming her body and converting the energy. She was running short on her supply of magical fuel, and her powers would wane, her skull becoming a prison of torment if she failed to acquire more before long. These weaklings offered only a few days' worth of relief and increased her magical abilities marginally. It had been a long while since she had eaten a truly powerful mind, but that would be rectified. As she began to roll over, Lula Moon's quickening mind the image of a purple unicorn sprang to light. Her scam had produced a truly powerful unicorn in Ponyville. More powerful than she had ever seen before. Her brain would likely prove to be a great boon for the Trixie's own strength, and she could only imagine the strength that she would gain after devouring the brain of that lavender unicorn, Twilight Sparkle.